There's a song that says, something beautiful, something good, all my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. And when I think of what he did for me, the pain and suffering that he experienced, I say that was something beautiful and something good. Even as I struggle through this life with all the challenges that come along, I know that he understands at every stage what is happening and that I can call on him to guide and lead and to forgive because every day I need forgiveness. I looked at two songs that I've added to the handout, song number 617, and this one has the phrase Suffering Servant, which is our title. Verse 2 of song 617. Edward Henry Joy is the composer, says, the suffering servant he became, yeah, more in loneliness and loss. He bore for me in grief and shame a crown of thorns, a heavy cross. By the end of the session, I'm going to look at a song, if we have time, by Harry Davis. And it says, from a lowly manger, I will follow thee. In the desert and the strife near thee I will be. In the sufferings of the cross I will gladly bear, and with thee in heaven I a crown shall wear. Continues, in the toils and conflicts faithful I will be. All things I will gladly bear, they'll be good for me. As a savior of mankind, slaves of sin to bring, give me holy courage, mighty, mighty king. So our transition will be starting to look at the suffering servant that Jesus became according to this prophecy. And by the end, we want to say, I understand what he did for me, and I will be faithful and true, regardless. Which raises an interesting question. Do you like pain? Is pain something that we look forward to experiencing? My first question asks, have you ever had to endure pain in order to obtain a positive outcome? As I was writing that question, I thought of childbirth which I have not experienced, but there are times that in raising a child, you might have to go through something painful. It might be tough love, a very painful transition to get a positive outcome where the child realizes that you're not as dumb as they might think when they're teenager. It's amazing how when they become adults, they realize their parents aren't so dumb after all. But there are other experiences too where you might have gone through something that's very painful and the outcome was positive. We sometimes call it investment. Studying for a test <laughs> might be a trivial or trite example. So that is the session in context. We will talk about this prophecy, uh, the five stanzas of this prophecy. I'd like someone to volunteer to read. We're gonna pause for prayer, but I'd like to know that somebody has offered to read in a minute. Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for what Jesus did for the whosoever will. We thank you that we are included in that whosoever will. And we thank you for the challenge that Jesus gave to us to go into the world and inform others about what he has done because it's for the whole wide world. So help us to be keen to tell, always ready to give an answer, and to want to serve you with our whole hearts at all times. Thank you for the promise of your presence even now as we are gathered here, the few of us, but we know that your spirit will guide us. We thank you for that promise. So may we have a good time as we break bread this morning. In the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Given the understanding of the term servant in the royal language of the ancient Near East, and I mentioned that in the outline, wise, exalted, extolled, and very high, do these words in verse 13 seem far-fetched, given who we understand the servant to be and what a servant was? Is it appropriate in your understanding that these words, if you take a look at the verse 13 again, it says, he shall deal prudently or wisely. He'll be exalted, extolled, and be very high. And obviously, if God is the speaker there, he is saying, my servant, has these characteristics. So is this a plausible 
understanding, do these words seem plausible to describe the sermon? Not most, say not most, but my If the servant is Jesus and the speaker is God, then it would be fine. Then it's but, appropriate. But if you just think of servant as a servant, you would think globally. And then there are exceptions. For example, I'm thinking of uh, the coat where he was a he was a servant to the to um, to the the king of Egypt, but he was wise and stole in his you can be a servant in a high position. That's kind of rare. And that's the context we're offering here. We're yes, saying that yeah. the understanding of the phrase servant in the ancient Near East was that the individual would be a trusted envoy, a confidential representative, or one who is chosen. So under those terms, it would seem appropriate that the speaker, who we are identifying as God speaking about Jesus, that he would use those words to describe him. That is the first understanding. If you accept the setup that I've offered, that there is this first stanza, and the speaker is God, and he is speaking about his servant who's going to suffer. He is saying, I'm sending this servant, trusted envoy, this confidential representative, this one who is chosen, and he's going to be wise, he's going to be exalted, extolled, and be very high. Any conversation? Yeah, I would think, my, my servant shall deal prudently during Jesus' life. Yes, he dealt prudently with those, with the Pharisee, okay? But he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. It didn't come until after that word, until after the death and the crucifixion and his resurrection. Because while he was living his life, he certainly was ex wasn't exalted and extolled to be very high. I like that. So in terms of prophecy, there is a period when the prophecy is actually going to be fulfilled. He certainly is wise and prudent, exalted. There are some people who might say that he is exalted when he is lifted up on the cross. But that's part of the suffering. I think that the way the prophecy ought to be interpreted. And again, if you have commentary, please tell me what it says. My commentary sends me to Philemon, sorry, Philippians. Yeah. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Which says, Philippians 2 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So that is what my Nelson commentary does in terms of linking this. High and exalted to the fulfillment of prophecy. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, so his face was marred more than any other man, and his form more than the sons of men. This one is tricky for me. How does verse 14 predict? Sorry, what does verse 14 predict will happen? To the servant. How do you understand verse 14 in terms of prophesying what will happen to the servant? He will be disfigured, marred in his face, and this is on the cross. He has on his head a crown of thorns. One song says, Sorrow and love flow mingled down as his head bleeds from these thorns in his forehead. As he is hurting, we have this experience that Jesus is suffering. He is disfigured. The prophecy says his face was marred more than any man. Just as many were astonished at you, at this point, so that's in his lifetime. The scripture said people were astonished at his teachings because he taught as one having authority and not like the teachers of the law. Now at this stage, now at the end of this lifetime, he is disfigured. He's disfigured in many ways. The stripes on his back, the nails 
in his hands and his feet, the slit in his side, the crown of thorns on his head. But even more, um, if, during Lent last year, I was reading a, a book, uh, a small book, and um, I don't even remember the title of it. I've got it at home. Um, but it talked about what Jesus saw in the cup that he, that, that in Gethsemane, and he it really brought it home to me because he saw not only the individual sins of, you know, the minor sins, he saw all of the, the sins that were to come, the, uh, the horrors that man can do to, pe people can do to people, and the implications of that. And when we talk, when when I read that, I looked back. I, I brought back in my memory this verse that says he was more damaged than you know, ugly than we could imagine. But those were in the eyes of God because when he died, that's what he was. Was not only my sins and your sins, but every sin committed since. He took the apple and took a bite to the end of time. And these were, he was damaged. Um, God could not look on that. Let's take this one step further. What kind of sacrifice does God accept in the old sacrificial system? What do we know the sacrifice did? It be an unblemished, unblemished. perfect lamb. And so if that is what God is accepting, yeah knowing that his suffering servant is <coughs> sinless, unblemished lamb, in the process, the mutilation that occurs to the lamb is that the lamb is sacrificed and sheds his blood. So that's part of the experience here. He will have this experience where he will be marred more than any other man and is formed more than the sons of men because he is going to be making this ultimate sacrifice, taking on the sins, as Major Linda said, of everyone who has ever committed a sin, everyone who will commit a sin. This is a great suffering. Remember what Jesus said just before he took the cup, so to speak. He said, if it were possible, let this cup pass from me. Then he added, nevertheless, not my will. The whole reason for him coming was to accept, to receive this cup of suffering and accept it on our behalf. Okay, chapter 53, verses 2 and 3. What are the ways the suffering servant was despised and rejected? And you need not just look at those two verses, but anything that comes to mind. How was the suffering servant despised and rejected during his time of ministry, three-year ministry? First of all, how does he start out his birth? Despised and rejected. His birth occurs where? In a barn. Very humble, low esteem. Shepherds, the lowest of the low, come to witness this experience. So there's no glorification there at that point in time. If you think of the kings who came a couple of years later, that was another aspect. But certainly there were not people who were from his realm. There were people who were from other realms, from the Orient. Humble origins. What was his profession that he was being trained for? Carpenter. Carpenter. Another lowly <laughs> profession. Where was he from? Nazareth. Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The rabbis asked. And what kind of death did he die? That of a criminal. That of a criminal. So the whole thing has no glory in it. A humble origin, a humble career or trade, and apart from the three-year ministry, it looks like this is not the Messiah. This is not someone who we are anticipating to come and rescue us from Rome or from oppression. This can't be the Messiah. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Even though we are told that when he taught, he taught with authority, the people who were rejecting him were the establishment, the Pharisees and the scribes and the other important people, the Sanhedrin, were saying, no, he is not the Messiah. And certainly we don't like his style because it opposes Rome. And that makes him a rebel. 
And we are trying to have peace with Rome so that Rome will allow us to continue to have our internal self-governance. And this is not what we are expecting. So his ministry was very despised and rejected. His lifestyle was nothing glorious. His followers were simple men, uneducated fisher folk. Maybe there was a tax collector. Yes, Judas was educated and wealthy, but he was a rebel who wanted to help with this leading to overthrow Rome. But there was not a lot that around him that looked glamorous. He associated with prostitutes and sinners. So there is not a lot that glorifies him in the eyes of Israel at that point in time. Question number five. Verse three says, we hid our faces from him. The speaker in verse three. If it is indeed Israel, we hid our faces from him. My question is, in what ways do we hide our faces from him today? How do we hide our faces from Jesus? How do you hide your face from him? There are times in our lives when we are associating with the world. Not necessarily doing things that are bad, but at some level not standing up. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So someone says something that we don't actually believe or we don't actually adhere to, and we don't say anything. I think that we're hiding our face from God when that happens. Because he expects that we would actually stand up and be represented. We will say, I will follow thee, like the songwriter says. From the lowly manger, I will follow thee. In the desert and the strife, near thee I will be. Even the sufferings of the cross, I will gladly bear. And then we don't do that. Because it's just too hard. It's not popular, and it will not win us any friends if we decide that we're going to stand up, stand up for Jesus. Even the sufferings of the cross, I will gladly bear. So I think at some level, we hide our faces from God when we start to compromise with the culture. I'm going to go to question number seven, so we move into it. Another stanza. What insights can we glean from verses 4 through 6 as to why Jesus did not defend himself? Verses 4 through 6 says, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We, Israel, he is doing this for us, obviously for the sins of the whole world, but we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. In other words, he is being punished by God because he has done something wrong. That was the, the understanding. Yes. That's what they were believing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity. And the interesting thing is that it was the leaders of the Jewish religion who went after him and presented him. They basically presented him as a gift to the Romans and said, get rid of him. So at the time that he is, verse 7, oppressed and afflicted, he doesn't open his mouth. He does not defend himself. The real reason, I think, is because this was his time to fulfill the reason he came to earth. So if he resisted at that point in time, his time had been fulfilled to become the Paschal Lamb. So there's no point in resisting. Even though you're innocent, this is the time for which you came. This is the experience that you're going to have because it's going to fulfill the prophecy of why you came. So there's no fulfilling point. Fulfilling his purpose. Fulfilling his purpose. So there's no point in defending himself because the time has come. He came to give us life, and by giving his life, he's given us life. Even though he had no sin, he was that unblemished lamb that needed to be sacrificed at that point in time. I'm going to skip ahead. A question number nine, they asked, why do you think people in Isaiah's time had trouble believing the prophet's message? And then the next question asked, why do you think some people today have trouble believing Isaiah's message? Certainly for those who do not think he is the Messiah, today they're saying, no, Messiah hasn't come. Therefore, we don't 
have to understand. We don't want to accept what Isaiah is saying as being fulfilled because we're still waiting for Messiah. But back in the day, I think they were living in hopeless times. They were watching things go downhill. And the first set of prophecies that had been given talked about the Babylonian exile. You're going to go into exile. So when he says, and then at some point in the future, he's going to send a suffering servant. You're thinking, well, there's so much you're saying here, man. We can't figure out what is the real situation. And if I tell you how your life is going to go and include some unpleasantness, maybe you don't want to hear that. So as he foretells what is going to happen, and certainly in any given lifetime, no one is going to experience all of this. It's going to be many lifetimes over 700 years later. And they were expecting a warrior king. A warrior king. They, they, wanted, they wanted, all they could see was a king physical being, the physical time they were in, and the only solution in those days was a warrior king. It's like we need, um, and it, it, even today, you know, much of our government money is spent on guns and, and soldiers uh, because we see that as the only way to protect ourselves. Israel wasn't any different than we are. They, they were they when they are expecting some somebody to come as their savior. They're not thinking spiritual, except a very few. So we come to the end of the session. We ask the question: Can suffering have value? What value can suffering have in the life of a Christian? First Corinthians 13 says, love suffers silently. It makes us a stronger person. It makes us, it makes us a better person. Mm -hmm. It makes us, gives us the ability and the strength to get through life and to facilitate others as we go. And as the, the prophet- opportunity for others to help, which is- And as the prophet is talking about what happens to Jesus, how he's going to suffer, in this next 40 days, as we think through this experience, it helps us to empathize with his suffering. And between now and Good Friday, maybe Easter Sunday, we're going to be thinking a lot about suffering. Some of us will give up a little bit of sugar in our coffee. Some of us will make larger sacrifices so that we can feel a little bit of empathy with what he experienced for us. But I think that suffering, while pain, is not necessarily a good thing. We don't want it. Sometimes we sing songs that say, to suffer and triumph. I'll go in the strength of the Lord. And sometimes we sing the words, and our heart isn't ready for the suffering, but we understand that almost all of the apostles died deaths where they suffered. Isaiah himself, remember what happened to Isaiah? He was sawn with a wooden saw at the end of his life. The bad king. So here he is prophesying, and his end is going to be suffering. Suffering is a part of what Jesus experienced. And we're told in the Beatitudes, be happy when men revile you, persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Rejoice. So we're told to suffer with a sense of purpose. Not to ask for suffering, but when suffering comes, that we understand that it leads to glory ultimately. So I'm going to read the verse again at the end of the handout and then we'll close. Harry Davis says in verse 2 of, chapter, of Psalm 501, From the lowly manger I will follow thee, in the desert and the strife near thee I will be. Even the sufferings of the cross I will gladly bear, and with thee in heaven. I have crowned shall wear. Just as Jesus understood that his time had come and therefore he had to do what he did for all humanity, we say, if I have to experience suffering so that I can receive the ultimate reward, then I will accept it. I will not shirk because there's pain now. I know that there's an investment made so that a future glory can be obtained. And sometimes we suffer so that others can be drawn closer to God. Suffering should not be viewed negatively it should be viewed as par for the course because we trust God 
and he will take us through whatever circumstances he leads us into. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we empathize with Jesus' suffering over the next six or seven weeks, we pray that you will help us to understand that suffering is a part of this experience. And help us to say like the song right here, that we will willingly suffer to extend your kingdom. May we understand this totally, and may we accept it as a responsibility, knowing that you will see us through. So again, we thank you for your promises, and we trust you, dear God, to take us safely through our lifetimes, if not physically, certainly spiritually, to get us through the reward that you have promised. So may we understand this deeply, and may we share it willingly, and may we live our lives gloriously. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.